think the Baron is still alive there. You notice his skeleton stand up at the end. So if there is a Manbork too, the Baron could still live as this Harryhausen skeleton, which I think is kind of wonderful. And he's probably got even more reasons to be depressed now. So that's well, I figure it would cut in at the beginning of Man Board 2 to him in like a hospital bed, like hooked up to an IV and just being all depressed. And he'd just be there for the entire movie. He wouldn't actually do it. <laughs> Connor, I want to talk to you about your performance because uh, you, you and, and, and uh, the Baron are fantastic in this film. Like, uh, where did Shenanigrams come from? <laughs> uh, was that you? Shenanigrams? Or... Yeah. Uh... I, I don't remember if that was me or Steve, but uh, I, it's so stupid it could have come from either of us. Well, what's the process on set with you guys? When you, how much riffing is going on in these films? Um, I improvised a lot. I don't remember how much the other people were able to. I know Adam couldn't at all because he was completely by himself. He, sh he shot totally alone for the whole movie, but I improvised a lot. And this, this stupid accent came from... Uh, me mostly just trying to entertain myself. I always used to do a, a Terminator impersonation that was a terrible uh, Australian accent. Uh, we used to do a Robocop versus Terminator thing, and I was an Australian Terminator. And then Steve had already written the movie and had written the role, and we hadn't started shooting yet, and he said, like, last minute, would you be able to do that in that Terminator accent that you, that you do? And that's how that came about. <laughs> Excellent. Andrea, I wanted to, she plays Shadow ne Nega, is that the name of the character, right? Shadow Mega in the film. I wanted to know, what's it like uh, working on a Steve Kostansky picture? And an Astron 6 picture for that matter. Uh, it's pretty interesting. Steve's really, really good with um, like envisioning everything in his head before he, uh, before he does it. So uh, he's really good at like positioning people, because like, everything is pretty much shot in front of a green screen. So. He knows exactly which angles to shoot and how to turn people around, and because you always have to be like obviously shooting towards the green, so he's really great with that. And he uh, says he wrote the character for me, the silent like bitchy girl. So <laughs> yeah, it was good. Well, actually, you bring up the productions, uh, and before I turn over to questions from the audience, I'd like to just start up with. This is like an insanely ambitious film with, in terms of effects and green screen work, and um, I just wonder if you could take us through how you achieved some of these elements, and you know how extensive was the miniature building and such. I know it's a big question, but yeah, well, I spent a lot of time rummaging through dumpsters looking for old balsa wood and things to build these miniatures out of. Like pretty much everything you see on the screen is made out of garbage or something that somebody gave me because they were like, hey, I have this old circuit board I don't want. And I'd be like, yes, I can put that in the background of this set. So it was a lot of just scrounging for stuff. And the same goes for the costumes too. It was a lot of uh, going to old uh, used sports equipment stores and buying all their hockey pads and then being like, you're buying a lot of hockey pads. Being like, I can't tell you why. Okay, I'm going to start opening it up to the audience. Got questions in the audience? Right there. What was the budget? But, uh, well, it was pretty much whatever I had in my pocket at the time. So I think after three years, it cost me about a thousand dollars, maybe. <laughs> I, I know it looks like... I know it looks like it cost a lot more than that. It looks like at least an $80 million picture. <laughs> but it was only a thousand dollars. Any other questions in the audience? Yeah. Do you have anything else you're working on, Chris? Uh, I have some things that are floating around in my head that uh, I've started to put down on paper. It's nothing that I think I'm ready to announce yet, but I am working on stuff. And you're there also, are things happening. There is stuff on the horizon. You're also working on other films too, as a special, like you worked on The Divide as a special effects um, makeup artist. Yeah, right now I'm on Resident Evil 5, and it's kind of taken up all my time. So when that's done, I'll probably try to segue into making another movie. Other questions? Right there. I guess, um, like, what other inspirations did you put into the movie besides the Terminator and Robocop? Uh, well, the movie kind of looks like an old like CD-ROM video game cutscene. <laughs> And that was a big inspiration, because I used to play a lot of computer games when I was young. So I wanted kind of to have that Rebel Assault kind of look to it. <laughs> the, the like Wing Commander-esque kind of 
you know, vibe to it. Uh, Mortal Kombat. Mortal Kombat was a big influence, again, going back to video games, but also the film as well, which I really like, is a guilty pleasure of mine. Um, and then besides that, just, yeah, lots of 80s VHS movies, like straight to video stuff, like anything from Full Moon. I'm wearing my, my Canon video shirt. Uh, yeah, that's, that's all I can think of. Right there. Justin. <laughs> Why are you standing? Because he's Justin. made a really good movie and I don't want to see that. So, oh, oh. Oh, oh, thanks, Justin. <laughs> Justin's in love. <laughs> The very first scene that we filmed was the scene where Matt fights the champion, the big stop motion monster. And so it was a lot of me going like, now shake yourself around like you're in his hand and he's shaking you around, but don't move too much or else the camera's not gonna see you. So he'd stand there going like this. And I'd be like, no, no, more like this, blah. And it was just a lot of me making noises and people not knowing. It's the Verhoeven method. Yeah, that. exactly. But uh, we shot it in my parents' garage and the basement of a store that sold blinds. <laughs> so yeah, our, our location... Did the blinds really end up in the movie at all? Oh no. <laughs> they tried to pretend like we weren't there, but we were. <laughs> Is there any other questions? Right there! Uh, whose decision was it that Dr. Scorpius would replace Manwork's chin? <laughs> oh, his chin piece? Yeah, I like that. I like to be a synthetic chin. Yeah, well, that was, I felt like with the eyepiece, he just needed a little extra something. I don't know, it was just, because in Eliminators, I think, if I remember correctly, it goes like all the way around his face. And I built the mask actually like on his eye out of, uh, it was a packaging for an old scuba mask. It has like a generic guy face, so I just cut out the eye and then I had you know, the rest left over, and I was like, well, maybe I'll give him a chin piece or something, I don't know. I'll put some little rockets on his head. So, yeah, it just no real reason other than to add something else to his face. Just one more thing I could glue on and have Matt have to clean up after the end of a long shooting day. Did you ever walk home in the costume or anything like that? We definitely walked around in full costume, went to Safeway, bought subs. It was good times. One more question, maybe, if there is one in the back there. I wanted to ask about the music, if you could talk about it. I know Jeremy, Jeremy did the amazing score for Father's Day, by the way. I just got to get across to that again. Well, some of it, some of it, yeah. Um, but, Actually, uh, the composer of all the music is here. His name is Brian, and he's sitting Brian's here? here. Awesome. Stand Brian, up, stand Brian. up. Stand up. Brian, terrific score. Brian basically saved the movie, as far as I'm concerned, by doing all the music for it and making it sound like a million bucks. Like, it's really like the perfect 80s synth score. I remember you I showed me a pre, like a rough cut version and you had all the songs you wished were in there. And I remember, oh, yeah. oh how, like, my wish was, list of songs was pretty it was, insurmountable. And, but yeah, somehow he did it. Yeah, he did do it. It was fantastic. Yes, right at the back. I want to ask you to the Yep. Number one man, yep. Uh, well, his costume, like his red sash, is an obvious reference to uh, Johnny Cage in the first Mortal Kombat. Uh, but I've always wanted to have a like badly dubbed kung fu character just placed in the middle of a movie where he doesn't belong. <laughs> and so I felt like, well, I'm throwing pretty much everything, including the kitchen sink, into this movie. I might as well just put in a guy. And I don't actually know where the name came from. I, uh, the voice was uh, Kyle Ebert, Herbert, Herbert, Herbert. Herbert. Ebert. Uh, I don't know, he does like lots of anime. Uh, He's the narrator on Dragon Ball Z. Yeah, I just sent him an email and I was like, hey, do you want to do the voice for this kung fu guy in this movie? Yeah, he's. I think he does Ryu in Street Fighter 4 or something. I don't know, he's pretty prolific and he was a super nice guy, didn't charge me too much and was, you know, very supportive of the movie. So, yeah. I'm sorry, did I cut Brian off earlier about the music? Did you want to say something about it? I just wanted to say that anyone could have done it with that if they were given that brilliant. <laughs> oh, thanks, Brian. He's like the nicest guy in the world, too. <laughs> if you haven't noticed already.
Alrighty, if there are no other questions. Oh, oh, sorry, I'm blinded by the blinding light. Um, number one actually kind of seems like why you and the Street Fighter movie. Is that like. I actually haven't watched the Street Fighter movie in like 10 years. <laughs> I don't remember his right. memory. Yeah, maybe I subconsciously placed him in like that. <laughs> Really? Okay, I'm gonna have to watch that again. All the characters just remind me of fighting. <laughs> yeah, well, that's what they were supposed to be like. I think the biggest influence of the whole thing was that it was supposed to feel like a movie based off a video game, based off a line of toys, possibly based off comic books or trading cards or something. Because I've always liked the idea of like a movie coming through different media, like you know, transitioning from different different mediums, and as things shift and you know, the designs change and stuff. Like, it feels very filtered down through a bunch of different ideas, which I think is why all the characters feel so random and sort of out of place. So, yeah. Cool. Any more?